Um, first of all, uh, my name is Matt. Um, I've been doing sound design for about three years, and I've been working in Unity for about one. Um, I moved here recently, about like, last fall, from Boston, um, so I'm kind of new to this area. Um, in this talk, I want to talk about um, some challenges um, that I hit when making an audio. So by audio game, I mean audio only, uh, so it's effectively played on a, on a blank screen. Um, and I want to talk about them because uh, I think the challenges are perhaps generally interesting for anyone making any kind of game. Um, and also because I think that audio games are really an underserved medium, and if I can convince anyone to work on one, I think I'm doing my duty. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, me and a couple other people worked on the game, uh, uh, which title you see up there. Um, so our goal was to basically create an experience that was identical for players at all levels of visual ability. Um, so from the very first, um, you know, moment of the game, the main menu, um, everything is on a blank screen and everything is conveyed through audio cues um, all the way to the end. Um, we also wanted uh, the setting to feel like a real place. Um, you know, we thought about maybe making something abstract, um, but we wanted it to be to feel like a an actual environment around uh, the app, the the player, um, and a story with, with characters and the dialogue, uh, making it very story driven. Um, and finally, we also wanted to kind of strike a balance between helping the player understand uh, what's going on around them, while also leaving some things up to the imagination. So we made some things kind of deliberately weird and unexplained, um, so that uh, the player can kind of is left with the kind of gap that they can fill with their own brain uh, as to what's going on. And I think that's kind of a strength of an audio game. You leave things up to the imagination. Okay, so um, the challenges that we hit, there were kind of two kinds. One was challenges that we anticipated, which are sort of somewhat interesting, um, and I'll run through a couple of those. Uh, and then a few challenges that we didn't anticipate, which I think are actually the most interesting ones. So challenges we did anticipate are things like orienting the player. I mean, that's um, Kind of a key part of the game is uh, the player is an avatar on the screen or in, in the world and uh, they use audio cues to direct themselves in, in kind of the right direction and aim and so forth. So that was kind of a core thing that we knew was going to happen. Keeping them from going in the wrong direction, um, communicating what's going on around them through audio alone, um, keeping the audio sort of optimally mixed uh, so that you know it's immersive, there's a lot going on around them but they don't miss anything, they don't miss important instructions, that kind of thing. Um, and giving the player uh, instructions for the for the first time, you know, telling them what the controls are was something that we. Those are all things that we um, anticipated. Um, a couple challenges that we didn't anticipate or didn't, I guess, think about as much as we should have going into. Them. So this is what we mean by sort of first time instructions. This is the first screen of Gone Home. Um, it basically just tells the player the basic kind of controls to play the game. Uh, this we were ready for, um, and we found a way to present that. Um, what we sort of didn't think as much about is how important um, in sort of embedded instructions are uh, in a game. Um, almost taking it for granted where, you know, in, in, in Gone Home, whenever you, um, you know, point your cursor or crosshair at something, uh, a, an action is, uh, pops up and there's this sort of text that tells you what you're going to do if you hit the interact button. You know, same with other games, you see it everywhere. It's, it's very um, fluid, it's very unobtrusive. Uh, you just say, you know, the button and then uh, what that button is gonna do. Um, it works really well. None of this can really happen this way in an audio game because in an audio game, um, if you're gonna try to remind the player uh, which button to use, you have to, you know, say it out loud uh, with dialogue or maybe there's another solution we didn't think of. Um, if the player, you know, if you're worried that the player is going to forget instructions, which, which happens a lot, um, or if they miss it the first time, um, to remind them, you have to just say it again, as opposed to just being able to pop up with a prompt like this. Um, it's tough to strike a balance between making sure the player is sort of on task and knowing what to do, and not being too annoying with uh, constantly reminding them, oh, you press the space bar to do this, and so forth. Um, and also just sort of at an abstract level, it's kind of interesting to kind of realize that in any game there's always this rogue voice, this, this kind of third-party narrator just telling them things. <laughs> um, and we tried to do it a bunch of different ways in audio, and it's just very, very weird um, when you don't do it graphically. Um, finally, uh, the last challenge I want to talk about, I don't really have a slide for this, um, but it was even more fundamental. Um, 
we ran into problems where players didn't understand that there was a 3D space around them. Um, and this happened because uh, when we started developing, um, I just kind of showed off what we were working on in gray box mode. Um, so just showing you know, the different uh, game objects in Unity and how they were working. And then eventually I uh, blacked it all out when it was kind of functional as an audio game. I blacked everything out and then it was on a blank screen. Unfortunately, that meant that everybody who had seen uh, you know, any screenshots or any videos of that game had effectively been contaminated as a tester because they had this knowledge that, okay, this is basically like Doom or Quake where I have an avatar and I run around, um, but in this case, it's like my monitor is off. When we gave the game to a player who didn't have that advanced knowledge, they weren't even able to understand that there was a 3D space around their character. They were imagining something, but it wasn't what would help them play the game. It wasn't what we wanted. Um, some people went into it imagining, okay, is this a 2D plane? And am I just like moving across it? That kind of thing. Um, we ended up kind of solving this problem um, by putting a lot, um, a lot heavier focus on uh, ambience and uh, making <coughs> sounds within the world kind of appear in an intelligent way around the player, so that you know as you as you walk, um, you know uh, a random sound is generated, you know x distance in front of you to a random side, so that then when the player rotates, they hear that sound kind of panning left to right, or they hear it attenuating, um, and that kind of intuitively helped people understand, okay, I'm in a 3D space. Um, but early on, that was a challenge, and that was actually, we had to change the controls to kind of fix that as well. Um, mouse look was a total non-starter. Um, we had to change the tank controls to even help people know what was happening. Um, so that was that was a very strange moment when after working on it for several months we um, gave it to somebody and it, just, it was just unplayable. Um, uh, but we fixed it and um, uh, I guess it all went off from there. Um, I think that was it. Yep, that's that's my talk. I don't know if that was five minutes, but if you sorry, go ahead. Well, I have two questions. Uh, one, how did you guys? Um, I guess. Put like a sound map in place with these kind of ambient noises mm -hmm. and panning to make it all interactive. Were you using, because there's been a lot of talk uh, like in GEC uh, a month or two ago about ambient sign uh, audio using like uh, microphone configurations when they were recording audio that make like 3D. Uh, did, you, did you work with anything like that or was it just kind of manually trying to put stuff in place to sync? No, it was it was kind of a simpler solution. Um, we basically, you know, because it was taking place on an actual um, in a, in a um, basically it's a Unity game, and there are actual objects and colliders and so forth. Um, we could just spawn a um, or instantiate a um, an audio source somewhere, and then let Unity handle the uh, attenuation and the panning left and right. So um, yeah, we haven't tried those multi mic like setups. The axis in the waveform. Not really, it was, yeah. And second question, uh, can I get your business card? Sure, yeah, absolutely, I'll give you one. Any question? Yeah. You, you mentioned the challenge with reinforcing basic controls. Yep. Could you address that a little more? I was curious how you actually did that. Like, was it speaking aloud or something else? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I wanted to focus mostly on the challenges because I feel like our solutions are less interesting than those. Um, we ended up doing it with dialogue. Um, basically, um, the uh, instructions were, were given sort of um, within the context of the dialogue between the two characters, and they were repeated. Um, and then when the player uh, was kind of tasked with um, carrying something out, um, we had code to determine whether they were kind of moving towards that objective or whether they were stuck. So if they were standing still or something, um, then there was an audio clip that would play dialogue to remind them um, of, of which button to press and what to do. Or if they were kind of shooting spells in the wrong direction, um, it would remind them. And we tried to make the instructions get shorter and shorter every time. So it would just be a quick reminder and not really, let's start from the beginning and explain this. I don't think it was a, a very elegant solution, which is um, you know, why I want to kind of try this again and maybe there's another way to do it, but it was, it was functional. In the back. Yeah, just a uh, um, kind of Steve learning curve with FMOD. So to his point, you can use FMOD to play sound in a 3D space. So it's really cool. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, when you're integrating music into this, are you using FMOD or are you doing it in the yourself? No.
No, I, I um, implemented into Unity uh, directly. Um, I haven't used uh, FMOD or Orbalize, um, but uh, yeah, it's something I want to play around with eventually, but in this case, I just did it directly. So, did you look at any additional SDK support for spatial audio? Did you look at my sector or any of the other companies that handle this? Because Unity you know, spatial audio is not really true. It's, it's not what? It's not true special audio. So have you looked at any additional SDKs that people like FMOD that would want to put out uh, other companies that work to focus just in this area and play with any of those SDKs? Um, no, not really. Uh, not for this project. Yep. This is very common. Uh, I've got a friend who's blind and he's talking about playing audio games and that's the only thing I need. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, there's, there's, there's some really cool ones out there, uh, but there could definitely be a lot more. Anyone else? <laughs>